Now that the Blu-ray and book have been released, and no one has anything to look forward to for the rest of eternity, I think it's appropriate to talk about some final criticisms I have about both Twin Peaks The Return and by extension, David Lynch. Bullshit. So, Twin Peaks The Return Season 3, a limited event series. Where do I even start? One of David Lynch's biggest flaws is his encouragement of having people read into his work with their own interpretations, which often leads to fans offering their own twisted, ridiculous ideas which clearly weren't intended in any capacity. There are specifically three aspects of the basic filmmaking process that are inadequate in the return, but which are all used as examples of the show's supposed great symbolism and thematic brilliance, and why Lynch is one of the greatest artists of our generation. I will tell you three things. Number one, the special effects in the show. I understand why they're not great. I'm sure they didn't have some massive budget. And I'm sure Lynch also likes to experiment with certain effects to make them a bit jarring. But there's no reason to defend the poor special effects by attributing more bullshit interpretations to them. Krista Bell is walking funny because she's a Black Lodge spirit? Episodes are so bare in both substance and intrigue every week that fans have to resort to analyzing every single minute detail and assigning deep and significant meaning to them, as viewers are trying to fulfill their own desires of what they want the show to be like by filling in the holes with their own absurd ideas. If doing this brings you enjoyment on a personal level, I suppose it's fine, have at it. But to pretend that the show is incredibly complex and has intricate, unique themes that are being explored is unfounded. I turned and looked. I saw myself. I saw myself from long ago. Number two, the continuity errors in the show. Throughout the filming of 18 episodes with a rigid shooting schedule, it's okay to have some mistakes, but there's no need to pretend that Lynch is so perfect that these mistakes are, wait for it, done intentionally to demonstrate something deep. The editor of the series, Dwayne Dunham, admits that sometimes they just had to go with a take that had a continuity error because that's the best performance they captured when shooting. And that's fine, though there are some cases where it's sort of lazy, like when they flip a shot that they used before, or when a character has blatantly different hand positions after each cut. These sort of things take you out of the scene sometimes. Fans deserve a gold medal when it comes to their mental gymnastics and trying to defend the show. I'm actually quite impressed sometimes with the stuff they come up with. It's sort of like they're writing their own Twin Peaks fan fiction. Number 3, the timeline inconsistencies. These inconsistencies are interpreted as alternate realities and dimensions and timelines and whatever else is cool these days. Most of the timeline inconsistencies can be drawn up to the fact that Lynch of Frost Rota is one big disorganized wreck and shot it like that as well, and then they have to try to make it work in the editing room. In that same interview with Dwayne Dunham from earlier, he spoke about how he and Lynch had all these cards with characters in their scenes and tried to piece it together. Holy jumpin' man! Looks like a big mess to me. In a Reddit AMA, Mark Frost ended up saying that for the most part, everything in the show appears in chronological order. This really dampened the mood of the tinfoil apologist. Speaking of Mark Frost, he also said something interesting about David Lynch many years back, which I think is quite topical in regards to the return. To paraphrase, Mark Frost said that David's strength comes from creating mood rather than being an interesting storyteller. The interviewer replied by saying, he's got a great eye for hot looking women. Sexual harassment now is the new topic of the day. Oh geez, I hope Lynch doesn't turn out like Tom Sizemore and Robert Groper. Mark Frost kind of shrugged that comment aside and said that David isn't really good at working at Logic. He's a simple guy and he doesn't even know what's meant by some of his stuff. Damn! David Lynch has some of the most rabid fans I've ever seen. And one might get the false impression that there's an abundant number of fanboys on the loose given how outspoken the few of them really are. I'm not some dude who hates David Lynch's guts. I liked or loved the majority of his films. Blue Velvet? That shit is amazing. I mean really, with Laura Dury and McLaughlin, would you rather have this stupid schlock or the chicken walk? <laughs> Isabella, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked forward to the return and was very open to the idea of liking it. I wanted the show to win all the upcoming Emmys before it even aired. I take issue with the idea that Lynch is a god of sorts who can't be criticized in the slightest. His work has seemingly been on the decline since Mulholland Drive, Inland Empire wasn't very well received, then he went into hiding for 10 years, only to turn out some vile series which is void of any meaningful or entertaining substance. The unapologetic praise of Lynch as a genius today might be one of the few real mysteries of the show. I don't know, I guess since the Bergmans, Tarkovskys, and Kurosawas are all dead, Lynch is sort of the living embodiment of what I like to call AAA films. Avant-garde, art house, and auteur filmmaking. I guess Lynch also gets bonus points in the public for being American. But unfortunately, the Return doesn't have any of the merits of an avant-garde film, but it has all the shortcomings. Bullshit! Fuck! 
A lot of fans claim that the return will change television, just like the original two seasons did. I do not see this happening in any capacity, and if it does, I feel bad for people who regularly watch TV. The show was a flop on many levels, so who wants to replicate it anyways? There's also been a lot of intellectuals calling the return a movie rather than a TV show. Of course Lynch is going to consider it to be one long movie, considering how much he hates TV, and all of his fans and pretentious websites are going to follow suit and hail the return as the best movie of 2017. Oh, look at this. This is great. Someone is arguing that The Return has parts and not episodes, so it's not a TV show, of course. Seriously? David Lynch, of course, has admitted that he wrote and shot The Return as if it was one big movie out of order, and then pieced the puzzle together in the editing room. But this didn't work out too well. As it seemed, they had some missing pieces. <laughs> There are long periods of time where characters are out of action. Sometimes you wonder if they'll come back, and in some cases they do, and others they don't. The Roadhouse in The Return is one of the stupidest things I've feasted my eyes upon in a while. Whenever characters went to the Roadhouse in the original series, something was actually happening there. Characters were interacting, and any music that played such as from Julie Cruz was important to establishing the mood for a particular scene. It's a shame they treated her like trash in episode 17 of the new series. In The Return, there's mostly random characters and stupid music being played. This girl itching her armpit, this little girl crawling, young adults talking about some stupid subplot that never amounted to anything. Frankly, the best performance in the Roadhouse in the new series is probably from my boy James Hurley. Why? Because it was actually a character we knew and could care about, even if just a little bit. Also, this was fun trolling on Lynch's part, though he probably genuinely enjoys the song. But for the most part, every time it cut to a Roadhouse performance, it was like, oh geez, it is happening again. A lot of the attempts at having emotional moments in the show fall completely flat. Case in point, the whole subplot with Big Ed Hurley and Norma Jennings. We have no scenes whatsoever between Ed and Nadine until they decide that they are splitting up in episode 15. Okay, I didn't even know you guys were still together. Which is soon followed by Ed going to the Double R Diner, doing some David Lynch approved transcendental meditation, and then getting back together with Norma after 25 years. It's just sort of shoehorned in all sloppily and seems like an afterthought. Yet, we're supposed to feel some deep emotional resonance with the characters. People were so touched by the scene that they apparently cried. I don't know, I guess I was crying too. But it wasn't out of joy that a character we just learned split up with his partner 25 plus years decided to pursue the woman we thought he might have been with at the end of season 2 over 25 years ago. A lot of the characters have nothing going on for them. It's like we catch up with these characters 25 plus years later, Ben Horn, Audrey Horn, Dr. Jacoby, etc., and we're told what happened to them, but nothing comes as a result of it. We learned that Ben Horn has somewhat changed his ways, and isn't quite the womanizer he once was. And we learned that Dr. Jacoby is ranting in the woods, but that's it. Characters like this don't contribute anything to the story. It's just sort of like, remember this character? Well, this is what they're up to nowadays. They're setting up these characters with new characterization and traits, but there's never any payoff to anything. Not only did Lynch and Frost struggle to create compelling characters with proper motivation, they even failed to build upon previous characters, and were unable to make them worthwhile to the narrative. Then you have the fans of the show who resort to the classic line, You're just upset that this isn't your cherry pie Twin Peaks anymore. Yeah, I suppose you're more the Dougie Jones pounding cherry pie mindlessly type of guy. I'm almost with the promotional material before the show aired, where Cooper had a tape recorder in his hands. That's some deceiving marketing going on. As a little side note, imagine Chris Isaac and Kiefer Sutherland were on board with the return. I mean, they haven't aged terribly, and they could still act. And imagine the two of them teaming up with Miguel Ferrer and Lynch's characters, and if Cooper was actually Cooper, and interacted with these characters as well. I guess if the story is terrible, it doesn't matter, but at least it would have made it a little bit interesting. But instead, we got Dougie Jones and Krista Bell, and now Ferrer is dead, and everyone else is getting older. So forget about this. Fuck David Lynch. Fortune! Fortune! I see that my previous two Twin Peaks videos had the distinct honor of being shared on some weirdo websites. So I'll quickly address some of the criticisms that my criticisms received. Rand, King, and House of Leaves. So these are the people who hate Lynch. As mentioned earlier, I don't hate Lynch, and I never read anything from either Rand or King, surprisingly, and never owned or even heard about House of Leaves. So whatever point you're trying to make, you can throw it in the trash right next to the Blu-ray of The Return. This guy's insufferable. I suppose I am. I'm uh, right up there with The Return. Epic showdown with his inverse self? People actually wanted that? Like, could you imagine Kyle fighting himself on screen? <laughs> that would have been pretty stupid looking. I didn't literally mean some anime style showdown where they're punching each other repeatedly in the face. Just some sort of interaction between the two of them. Something clever where Cooper manages to use his wits to defeat Evil Coop. Instead of, you know, Lucy shooting him. And if you want to talk about stupid looking, look no further than that very episode, where a random British YouTuber is punching CGI Bob. Alright, any more of these stupid comments? Skip it. 
Let's get to the jokes. Special Agent Dale Cooper is the greatest asset that Lynch and Frost had at their disposal, one of the most iconic characters in TV history, and they failed to use him effectively. Sure, he's older, and maybe it wouldn't have worked quite as well, but he did a bang-up job in episode 16 when he snapped out of it. To be fair, in isolation, some of the Dougie scenes are slightly humorous, but is this really what fans wanted or need out of a Twin Peaks show? Is there a deep meaning in having our main hero be reduced to a bumbling idiot for nearly the entire series? Whatever pseudo-themes of being born again and experiencing the world as an innocent could have been just as effective or even more effective if it was wrapped up in a more timely fashion. Instead, the show becomes, when is Cooper snapping out of it? What a mystery. Is that really what you want your show to revolve around? When is a second-rate character going to be replaced with the one that we actually prefer? It's a year of very interesting premise, all right. How about Vegas? No. It's fun. 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 On the topic of Dougie Jones and the supposed themes explored with him, wouldn't it have been infinitely better for the show to explore Cooper learning to live again after having 25 primetime years of his life wasted in some alternate dimension? He could have been discovering and utilizing new technologies and ways of living for the first time. Instead, we have Dougie Jones in awe of something basic like a tie. And he never acts of his own accord or actively pursues things other than coffee. He just kind of sits there and runs into things and is guided by Black Lodge spirits. I don't know, he, he doesn't do anything. When did he lose his marbles? Then we get to the finale of the show. All of the events that unfold in the last two episodes are arguably rock bottom for the return. Our recently rejuvenated Cooper suddenly cares about saving the suddenly important Laura Palmer all on his own. Things seem just fine the past 25 years with Laura dead and Cooper chilling in the Black Lodge. Anyways, I've seen a lot of Marks, including Mark Frost, rant and rave about the sheer hubris that Cooper is exhibiting by selflessly trying to save Laura Palmer. They even go as far as to try to defend the incoherent, unimportant, and nonsensical ending by labeling Cooper a tragic hero. The only thing tragic is this silly show. Typically, a tragic hero needs a moment of recognition where they realize where they went wrong exactly, and the audience needs to follow along but where they went wrong as well. For example, when I was watching the final scene for the first time, the first thing that came into my mind was Planet of the Apes, the original one, which ends with a revelation that's simple yet highly effective. You understand what's unfolded before your eyes, and you're sympathetic for the character and reevaluate the events that occurred prior in the work. Damn you! In the return, I guess Cooper messed up something during time traveling. Maybe Philip Jeffries had slippery fingers and pressed the wrong button, who knows. I guess Judy was too powerful of an evil force, and you're a foolish man if you think you could time travel and change the course of history. Okay, so our main character is an idiot who tries saving Laura for some reason or another. Who knows? And neither does Cooper when it's all said and done. He shows no regret, remorse, or neglects to even contemplate his actions. The most glaring problem with the ending is that Cooper never expressed any desire to save Laura Palmer until episode 17. Though one could almost see it coming, given Lynch's sudden obsession with Cheryl Lee starting with Fire Walk With Me, and also the TMZ leaked photos of Cooper and who many correctly guess to be Laura Palmer. So viewers were sort of able to brace themselves for something silly like this happening, like Laura Palmer becoming a significant player in the finale because her face is on the title screen, and she's also like Space Jesus now and such a pure, loving, significant figure in the world. The ending was really just a non sequitur when you think about it, with a side order of revision his history and Jack Nance's body double taking a piss into the river. Some of the other implications of the finale are that Cooper is doomed in an alternate timeline. So what? The bastard was stuck in the Black Lodge for 25 years while his doppelganger was supposedly wreaking havoc. He managed to escape the lodge, only to screw himself again just a few days later? Eh, if they ever make a season 4, he'll be Richard for 16 episodes. Then man should get back to the proper reality, only to screw himself yet again and get stuck somewhere else. Maybe he'll get stuck in a double R diner bathroom. There's yet another flaw with Cooper's plan is by saving Lori that one night, you're not addressing the root of the problem. She's still gonna be living with her father who abuses her. Did David Lynch forget what Leland and Bob represent? I mean, I guess he did with that stupid orb. Does it matter if we get a season 4 anyways? Clearly, it's gonna be more bullshit. Everyone's not getting any younger in any case. Just this past year, we've seen some important Twin Peaks actors pass away. And I'm sure this list will only increase during the next 4 or 5 years. Which is how long Lynch and Frost will take to write and direct another season. Or should I say movie? In many years, I'm sure some more fans, and even some of the cast will look back and say, What could have been? I cannot imagine how gutted some fans who waited 25 plus years for another Twin Peaks felt after watching The Return and being disappointed with it. It's a shame that with all the resources Lynch was provided, from an 18 episode package with complete control, and a list of many great actors, he wasn't able to make something really worthwhile. Maybe that's the issue. Maybe Lynch needs some constraints, especially in his old age, to make a really good product. While having others involved in the process of filming, writing, and editing, it may not have been totally Lynch's vision. But Lynch's sole unhampered vision does not equate the best possible vision for Twin Peaks The Return. The the original show is not some epic masterpiece, but it was about the characters, and the town, and the music, and the simultaneous warm feelings you felt with the sinister undertones it had. Whereas The Return is just a big pile of lifeless hogwash with meaningless plots and characters, recycled garbage, and missed opportunities. 
I'm so sorry. David Lynch. I will see you again in twenty five years.